you're building an API. Your front end needs to authenticate users. And you're staring at three options, basic auth, bearer tokens, and JWTs. Pick the wrong one and you'll either over-engineer your simple app or create a security nightmare in production. I'm going to show you exactly how each method works, when to use them, and the security mistakes that can cost you. This is part one of our authentication series. Today, we're covering the foundation. Let's dive in. Before we get into specific methods, let's establish what problem we're solving. Authentication asks, who are you? Not to be confused with authorization, what can you do? That's a different topic. Here's the core challenge. HTTP is stateless. HTTP is like a drive through window. You order, they hand you food, and the window closes. Next car pulls up, they have no idea you just ordered. They don't remember you, and they don't try to. Clean slate, every time. That's by design. It keeps things simple and fast. But it means you have to prove who you are every single time you pull up to the window. So how do we solve this? That's where authentication mechanisms come in. Today we're covering three approaches. Basic auth, the simplest, bearer tokens, the most common transport mechanism, and JWTs, self-contained tokens that are changing how we build APIs. In part two, we'll tackle OAuth 2.0 and single sign-on, but let's start with the fundamentals. Basic authentication. It's the simplest HTTP authentication scheme. Here's how it works. You take your username and password, join them with a colon, encode the result in base64, and send it in the authorization header with every request. Now, here's the critical part, and I'm going to demonstrate why this matters. Base64 is not encryption, it's encoding. Think of it like wrapping a gift. The wrapping paper makes it look different, but anyone can unwrap it in two seconds. So why use Base64? Because HTTP headers can only contain certain characters. Base64 converts your username colon password into safe characters for transmission. It's not for security, it's for compatibility, and anyone can unwrap it. This means if you send basic auth over plain HTTP, you're broadcasting your password in unencrypted form across the network. Basic auth over HTTPS is fine, the TLS encryption protects the credentials, but over HTTP, you might as well post your password on Twitter. There's another issue, you're sending credentials with every single request. That's a lot of opportunities for them to be intercepted or logged somewhere they shouldn't be. And if your credentials are in server logs, cache layers, or proxy logs, that's a security incident waiting to happen. Use basic auth for internal tools, local development, or simple machine-to-machine -machine communication where you control the network. For anything else, let's look at better options. Let's talk about bearer tokens, and we need to clear up a common misconception right away. Think of bearer like an envelope. The word bearer on the front tells the post office how to deliver it, give this to whoever holds it. But the envelope itself doesn't tell you what's inside, could be a letter, a check, or a gift card. That's what the token is, the content. Bearer is the delivery method, the token is the content. See, bearer is just the transport mechanism. The token that comes after bearer can be any format. Here's how bearer scheme typically works in practice with opaque tokens, random strings stored server-side. First, let's see how you get a token. The client sends credentials once, the server validates them, generates a random token, stores it in the database, and sends it back. Simple, you get your badge at the door. Now, every time you come back, you show your badge using the bearer authorization scheme. The server checks the registry, the database, every single time. You're in or you're not. This lookup happens on every single request. That's the trade-off. This is called an opaque token. It's opaque because the token itself contains no information. It's just a random identifier. The server must query the database every single time to figure out who this token belongs to and whether it's still valid. The big advantage over basic auth you're not sending the password repeatedly. You can revoke tokens without changing passwords. You can set expiration times. But the trade-off? A database lookup on every single request. In high-traffic applications, that's a real performance consideration. 
and if you're running multiple API servers, they all need access to the same token storage. That means you need Redis, a shared database, or some other centralized session store. This works, but it adds infrastructure complexity. So the question becomes, what if the token itself could tell us who the user is without hitting the database? That's where JWTs come in. JSON Web Tokens, JWTs. This is where things get interesting. A JWT is a self-contained token that includes data right inside it. Let me decode this for you, literally. A JWT has three parts, separated by dots. First, the header. The header tells us the algorithm used to sign the token, in this case HMAC SHA-256, and that it's a JWT. This matters because the algorithm determines how we verify the signature. Second, the payload. This contains your claims, pieces of information about the user, subject ID, name, roles, when it was issued, when it expires. This is your data. There are standard registered claims like sub for subject, expire for expiration, IAT for issued at, and you can add your own custom claims, anything you need. But here's what catches people off guard. This payload is only Base64 encoded, not encrypted. Anyone, literally anyone, can decode and read it. Go to jwt.io right now, paste any JWT, and you'll see everything inside. This is why you never put passwords, social security numbers, credit card numbers, or any sensitive data in a JWT. Only put data you're okay with the client seeing. User ID? Fine. Role? Sure. Password? Absolutely not. Now here's the third part that does make JWT secure. The signature. The server takes the header and payload, combines them, and creates a cryptographic hash using a secret key. This hash becomes the signature. If anyone changes even a single character in the payload, the signature won't match and the server will reject it. This means the JWT is tamper-proof. You can't change the claims without invalidating the signature. But remember, tamper-proof doesn't mean private. The signature prevents changes, but anyone can still read the payload. That's the key distinction. Here's the game-changing advantage of JWTs. The server doesn't need to look up the database on every request. The server just verifies the signature mathematically, no database hit. JWT verification is typically 5 to 10 times faster, and it means your server can scale horizontally without needing shared session storage. Each server can verify JWTs independently. But there's a trade-off. Remember how we could instantly revoke OPEG tokens by deleting them from the database? With JWTs, revocation requires additional infrastructure. JWTs are stateless, the server doesn't track them. To revoke a JWT before expiration, you need to implement solutions like a token blacklist, which defeats the stateless advantage, or use short-lived access tokens with refresh token rotation, or implement token versioning with user state checks. This is why JWT expiration times are critical. They limit the window of exposure. Most applications use short-lived access tokens, like 15 minutes, paired with longer-lived refresh tokens. When the access token expires, the client uses the refresh token to get a new one. The refresh token is stored in the database and can be revoked. This gives you the performance benefits of JWTs while maintaining revocation control. One more important point, signing algorithms. Let me explain with metaphors that make this clear. HS-256 uses a symmetric key, one secret for everything. Think of it like a house key. The same key locks and unlocks the door. This works great if you control the whole house, fast, simple, secure. RS-256 uses asymmetric keys, a private key and a public key. Think of it like a mailbox. The private key means only you can put mail in, sign tokens. The public key means anyone can check what's inside, verify tokens. This is better when you have multiple services that need to verify tokens from a central authentication service. Use HS-256 for simpler setups where you control everything, and use RS-256 for microservices architectures where multiple services need to verify tokens from a central authentication service. All right, let's talk security. These are the mistakes I see constantly, and they're all completely avoidable. Number one. Always use HTTPS. I don't care which authentication method you choose, BASIC, Bearer, or JWT, none of them are secure over plain HTTP. HTTPS encrypts the entire request, including headers. 
no exceptions. Number two, token storage. Where you store tokens matters. There are two main options, local storage and HTTP-only cookies. Local storage is vulnerable to XSS, cross-site scripting. If an attacker injects malicious JavaScript into your page and bypasses content security policy, it can read local storage and steal tokens. HTTP-only cookies can't be accessed by JavaScript, which protects against XSS. But cookies are vulnerable to CSRF, cross-site request forgery. The solution? Use HTTP-only cookies with the same site attribute, set to strict or lax. Number three, set appropriate expiration times. Short-lived access tokens, longer refresh tokens. Don't create a JWT that's valid for a year. That's a year-long security window if it gets stolen. Number four, never ever roll your own crypto. Use established libraries. For JWTs, use JSON Web Token in Node, PyJWT in Python, or similar libraries in your language. These have been tested and audited. Your custom implementation probably hasn't. And finally, be careful with JWT algorithm verification. There's a classic vulnerability where attackers change the algorithm from RS-256 to none or HS-256 to bypass signature verification. While most modern JWT libraries already protect against this by default, you should still explicitly specify the expected algorithm when verifying as a defense in-depth measure. Always whitelist the algorithms you accept. This prevents algorithm confusion attacks and protects you even if your library has vulnerabilities. So which method should you use? Let me give you a practical decision framework. If you're building an internal tool that only your team uses, basic auth with HTTPS is perfectly fine. Simple, effective, no over-engineering. For public-facing APIs, skip basic auth. If you need to scale horizontally with multiple servers, go with JWTs. They're stateless, fast, and don't require shared session storage. But if you're building a simpler application, don't over-engineer. Opaque bearer tokens with server-side sessions work great. They're easier to implement, easier to revoke, and for many applications, the database lookup isn't a performance problem. The key is matching the complexity of your off system to the complexity of your actual requirements. Don't use JWTs just because they're trendy if simple sessions will work fine. All right, let's recap. Basic auth is simple but requires HTTPS and sends credentials repeatedly. The bearer authorization scheme is how you transport tokens, and those tokens can be opaque or JWTs. Opaque tokens require database lookups but are easy to revoke. JWTs are self-contained, fast to verify, and stateless, perfect for scaling, but you can't revoke them easily without additional infrastructure. In part two, we're diving into OAuth 2.0, how sign-in with Google actually works under the hood, the different grant types, PKCE for mobile security, and OpenID Connect for authentication, plus single sign-on for enterprise applications. These are more complex protocols that build on what we learned today. If you found this valuable, subscribe for part two.